Hey, welcome to Master the World. This is our kit 110A. It's on your box, 110A blind tasting webinar if you're tasting with wines. Uh, today with me, we have three of our Master Sommelier hosts. Madeline Trifon is first up on my screen. Hi, Madeline. Hi, everyone. Awesome, coming in from Detroit, Michigan, of course. And then we have Tim Gazer coming in from New Mexico. Hey, everybody. Awesome. And of course, my business partner, Evan Goldstein, coming in from San Francisco. Live and in living color. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm going to get started with the, the if you've been with us for um, a few different uh, webinars, you'll see that the slideshow is a little bit different. The content is pretty much the same, um, but we just want to liven things up a little bit. Uh, Here's how you log on if you haven't already logged on. Uh, mtwwines.com is the URL that you should be at. If you're tasting along and you haven't started tasting, uh, I just want you to know that the pacing is gonna feel a little fast. If you're tasting, you can certainly do it and you can taste along um, with the master sommeliers here. If you've already started the evaluation, you can finish the evaluation with us and we'll talk more about the wines as we go. And if you're not tasting along, please don't feel left out. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for you to play along. Our master sommeliers are actually going to drop clues as we talk about sight, about aromas, about flavors, about structure, for you to guess along uh, theoretically what these wines are and then we'll reveal them to everybody at the same time. Anything you want to add, Evan? No, I, I, I think you, you um, got it all. The only thing I would just suggest for those of you who are out there um, who are, are engaged and all that with, with kits is great. But I do want to put a shout out for those people that don't have kits. I, I've actually heard from a few folks out there who say that even if you don't have a kit in front of you, just the, um, the narrative and the dialogues that we have are helpful in their learning process. So if you have friends who are just interested in the whole growth and palate evolution of, of what they're doing, um, you know, ask them to come on whether they have kits or not. And I also want to give a shout out to our friends who are dialing in internationally. I know we have some folks who are coming in from Italy. It is late for you. So thank you for joining us. Um, this is our sixth yeah. webinar and our eighth kit. So we started shipping earlier this year and through what we're going through right now together, um, it's been crazy with two wildfires and the continuing pandemic that we can still continue. Thank you for all the support um, from everybody for making it possible for us to, to keep working. Um, this is your wine community. And I say this because I know that my team and I here really treasure this monthly call that we have together and prep for this. Um, if you want to um, play along and be a little competitive, I know Christian and Becky are the two that have been constant in the leaderboard. You can join the leaderboard. I'm going to show you how. Even if you're not tasting with a kit, you can log into our website. And when you log in, all accounts are free. You can enter in the kit number under the start tasting button. And we're going with a full workout because we will taste through and go through all the motions of tasting. If you're interested in doing the leaderboard, we have, um, once you're logged in, a place here that says join or create a group. Just when you join or create a group, make sure you go for the thing that says CW72. So this um, makes sure that you're actually joining the group for this webinar. Uh, and then question point number two is just don't be afraid to ask questions. There are no silly questions in our book. Um, you'd be surprised how many people have the same question as you. Um, and we do have a lot of help. Andrea DeLugas is in the background helping me. So she's checking on people who raise hands. Um, and if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. And if you like a question that somebody else has asked and you want us to really answer that live, make sure you like it so that we uh, will see that a lot of other people have the same questions. If we don't get to your questions, don't worry, we'll answer them offline and the transcript will be shared as well as the recording. Uh, the third point here is just that virtual hugs and hellos are encouraged. Uh, I think that 
you know, when you have something to tell us where you are, even simple things like I like this wine, I don't like this wine, it's really helpful. Um, or if you're guessing along and you're thinking of all the choices that you have, you can certainly put it out there. Um, it's nice to see other people out here in our little virtual space. Just make sure you select panelists and attendees when you're sharing comments. Otherwise, it just comes to Tim, Madeline, Evan, and me, um, which is fun for us to see, but no one else sees it. And last but not least, the poll is going to help you play along even without a wine. We do take a lot of effort in setting up the polls. And so there are a little bit of trick questions. You know, if we are thinking, could it be a Australian wine? We might throw in another potential guess uh, that's similar. So it is set up to have fewer options than our website uh, so that we can actually teach along. If you have already figured out the wine, what we want you to do is think about what you would have picked if you didn't know what the wine was. Um, that way, it's really from a learning perspective, very helpful to see where um, you went the wrong path, down the wrong path. Okay, with that, we're gonna start everybody off with wine number one. You'll see that I'll be fast and furious. Everybody's on a time schedule here. And so Madeline's gonna kick off on the very first wine. Madeline? Hello, everyone. It's a joy to taste with you. And I will say, if you're staring at this, um, uh, this deck, as we call it, and you see all these descriptions and you get overwhelmed by the number of them, don't worry, because I usually get one or two in each line. So um, <laughs> don't be uh, intimidated by it. So we're doing wine number one. And, uh, you know, we, we don't write off the color. The color tells a lot of stories. This is very straightforward. You don't have to overthink it. It's definitely uh, for me, star bright. And the color is straw or even a pale gold in my glass with some hints of uh, green, which generally telegraphs youth. But we're not drawing any conclusions at this point. You park your, uh, your conclusion uh, uh, desperation until a little bit later. The, the look is, uh, is simply something that's going to be part of the whole. Then when we hit these uh, categories, we are combining both nose and palate. And for me, this is very much, uh, first of all, it's an aromatic wine. You know, I don't have to work uh, to get the fragrance. It meets me two, two thirds of the way up the glass. Um, citrus dominant for me, particularly um, lemon, white grapefruit, um, very fresh. And, um, and nicely ripe, not overripe. Uh, also, especially on the palate, there's a little bit of uh, peel zest uh, texture to it. In terms of uh, tree fruit uh, and vine fruit, not a dominant thing, but the greens really lead, meaning green apple and green pear, maybe a little bit of uh, green fig. No, I don't mean to imply any sweetness at all. Again, fresh stone fruit, minor, but you know, maybe a little white ne nectarine. Um, or a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, yellow plum, going down to tropical fruit again. More melon than anything else, I think. Certainly not, uh, you know, uh, loud pineapple or uh, or kiwi. Nothing like that. However, the florality is uh, to me enthusiastic. So it comes across as lemon and lime blossom. Uh, though take your pick. And um, I think we can move on to the next panel, Li Meng. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. In terms of green vegetable, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, other vegetable. Did you have green vegetable up on yours? Yep. It was um, on the previous slide. Okay, it was on the other slide. Well, green vegetable, I would say uh, it's mild, uh, a teeny little bit of, um, of bell pepper, but not much. Green vegetables. Um, green olive, you know, again, we're following the green element, maybe a little bit of celery, but I might be reaching. Other vegetable, a touch of ginger, not strong. However, the herbal character here is singing. Uh, particularly, I would say lemongrass, mint, uh, chervil, eucalyptus is a little too strong a description for my taste. Going down to the oak influence, this is very interesting because I'm perceiving more on the palate than on the nose, the possible perception of neutral oak um, due to the, um, the mouthfeel uh, and a little bit on the nose as well, but it's certainly not spicy and it's definitely not a strong element, but that will hold that thought. Um, 
For seed winemaking, I would bet money there's least contact on this wine because it isn't so much a flavor as it is a feel. Uh, and residual sugar, was there any? Oh, I totally forgot. Sorry, it wasn't on mine. Uh, inorganic earth, uh, for sure, and oddly as much on the nose as on the palate. I don't get organic earth in this particular tasting. And remember, you know, this is a snapshot of a wine in time. I may have tasted this months ago, but this is how I'm perceiving it at this moment. Um, but I definitely get a minerality on this wine. Uh, residual sugar, nava, acidity, you know, medium plus verging on high. It's definitely mouthwatering. You know, it pulls the wine forward. Alcohol, you know, medium to medium plus. I, I would... I would settle on medium at this tasting. It doesn't pull my attention at all. Uh, phenols, you know, low. I don't think they're non-existent, but there is a textural element. The texture itself is lean and tart for sure, but there's also a richness to it and a weight and a back uh, tone of creaminess to the wine. This is a complex wine. The finish is long and the complexity is medium plus verging on high. Very interesting wine. And so we're going to go into the poll. There are two sets of questions that we ask at each poll. There is the grape variety. Um, which of these grape varieties do you think or did you think it was? And then which of these regions do you think it's coming from? So um, I'm going to launch the poll right now and just give everybody a few minutes to um, enter your selection. While they're doing that, I want to say one thing that isn't uh, that much, um, it's not a metric and it's not quantifiable, but this is a, wi a wine of quality to me. And that's something um, that sometimes is a little indefinable, but I think due to the complexity and the length of this wine, it's uh, making me pay attention in the most well-mannered way. Mm -hmm. Great. Madeline, I see a lot of people in, um, the old world right now. So mm -hmm. there are definitely markers that I think are pulling people more to the old world or maybe the, the new world people are just pondering a little harder mm -hmm. and not quite there yet. How are we doing time-wise? Did I move that along quickly yeah. enough for you? Good. Great. So I, think we, I would say it's worth mentioning, Li Mang, um, to, and to everybody out there, that if one of the three varieties up at the top doesn't sing to you, um, or you thought when you made, uh, made your impressions originally that it was a different variety, note that down and perhaps share that in the, uh, in the chat room or, or wherever it is that we, I'm not good at this stuff, on where we put the questions, because that can oftentimes be an interesting uh, thought starter and um, combination. And, and uh, it's not to say that we might not put other down there too one day too. So. And this exercise is more about sharing as yeah. opposed to seriously, what Li Meng said is hugely important. What you think may be silly, you might have four other people who've been, you know, afraid to say the same thing. So uh, uh, grab your, your self-esteem from sharing too much as opposed to too little. So I see Pinot Grigio and Roan White Blend as a potential option in the hmm. chat box. Um, so I'm gonna end the polling right now and I'm gonna share the results and you guys can see that Sauvignon Blanc is definitely uh, standing out, but there are some people who went the Verdeo right. and um, Albarino, and I guess in other, it would be Pinot Grigio and Rhone Blend. Um, and we're seeing more people in old world. So I think Madeline talking about you know, reinforcing why they were right in thinking more old world and why it was a new world. Maybe let's start there. And then whenever you're ready, um, I will reveal the wine. Uh, I'm, who's, who are we waiting for to be ready? No, as long as you, whenever you're ready, um, if you want to talk a little bit about how ah. firmly in the old world. Ah, uh, yes, so sorry. Uh, and I didn't mind punching that because it was very strong for me. And, and to Li Meng's point earlier, um, you should actually, even if you have no wine in front of you, be able to listen to a good taster and make a reasonably correct deduction based on what we're saying, because we're not trying to be cute about it. We're trying to perceive and define accurately. I will say there's a big difference um, with, not that anyone's wrong, no one's ever wrong. It's in why you're considering certain larger uh, categories. To me, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris is, you know, not an aromatic category, whereas Sauvignon Blanc is. Albarino, you know, can be quite aromatic or semi-aromatic, Verdejo maybe a little less. So this is uh, something that can redirect uh, you uh, in terms of varietal recognition. 
-hmm. And what's defining us in old world versus new world, Madeline? Well, I would say, um, if, obviously, depending on what grape variety we land on, um, there the the not just the minerality or the inner, inorganic earth, but also um, the fruit is not strident. You don't have to work to to see through it, you know, to find other elements in the wine. Um, the other elements present themselves in in rapid succession. So. Um, you know, not to say that New World wines, uh, when they're young, whites when they're young, can't be complex as well and can't be long. Um, if uh, you gave this wine to me blind and it ended up being from the New World, I'd go, huh, that fooled me. Mm -hmm. So how's that? And yes, I can be fooled easily. <laughs> okay, so, so I'm let's reveal. Mm -hmm. reveal this. This is the um, a Bordeaux Blanc here. Mm -hmm. It's grape variety is Sauvignon Blanc, where everybody mostly lend it out, mm -hmm. and definitely from old world friends from Bordeaux. So mm -hmm. uh, comments. We also see a Sancerre mm -hmm. in the uh, um, comments below. Yeah, and I would I would I would talk to that for a moment. Remember on a couple of of things. This, by the way, has if you look at the stats and believe them, and I think they're telling the truth, it's twenty percent Semillon. 5% Sauvignon uh, Gris. They claim no wood on this, though, you know, I don't backtrack from what I said. Um, the, the- I like Tim's cooking... face, the no yeah. wood part. I'm not buying it. Okay, well, you think, okay, well- It, smell, it smells like oak. Well, it, it smells to me um, like Sauvignon Blanc that's been moderated by Semillon and Lees and a little bit of bottle age. It's an 18. It's not a super baby. If it's seen oak, I think it's used um, and or neutral. Uh, I am what? Yeah, big. Um, or big. And, or big or, or big. big barrels. But I do think that, you know, where do you, if you get yourself in France, big, yay. Yeah. Why do you go towards uh, Bordeaux Blanc as opposed to say Upper Loire? You know, I think there'd be more laser-like focus, particularly on the aromatics. And I don't think you would get um, that cushy, lazy uh, component. The Semillon has an effect, a quiet but significant effect. Gentlemen, do you want to add anything to that? It's very, very good quality wine. I, I want to throw it out there as uh, Evan and uh, Tim jump in. And I'd love for at least mm -hmm. Evan to explain how our observations might be different from a tech mm -hmm. sheet. Just want to get a poll out there from folks in the chat box. How many of you actually think that there is oak in this particular mm -hmm. wine? Is, is anybody perceiving that at all? And while you're doing that, I'm going to interrupt my colleagues to say one thing that's very unusual with this wine. This is actually, you know, Bordeaux Blanc can be from uh, uh, any number of places within Bordeaux. This is specifically um, on the right bank. There's a small pocket that they claim has um, uh, the type of uh, uh, limestone that lends itself to white production. And uh, so this is not from Entre de Mer or another place in, um, in Bordeaux. It's specifically right bank, uh, Saint Emilion Pomerol district. Yeah, let me, let me jump in on, on Li Meng's question because I think it's an important one and, and, and Madeleine has sort of echoed it in her comments. When, when uh, we sit down and we grid out these wines, um, we are not, we are doing it like you are as a blind tasting, which is to say, we're not sitting there tech sheet to our right side, bottle to our left side, knowing exactly what the wine is and gridding it to the tech sheet. That's really important for people to, to know that. So the perceptions that you get are that of uh, a collection of, of, of master sommeliers who are sitting it and working it together. The other thing that's important and why we've used the word perception to everybody is it is a perception thing because we're not sitting there looking at the tech sheet, which sometimes makes you either go nod your head or scratch your head. Um, it could be that on the day that it was gridded, um, there might have been a more of a sense of the wood. And the wood could also have been the com you know, again, if we go back to the conversation, the wood could have been more conversationally about texture, as well as simply about flavors and, and aromas and things like that, or light notes that might be showing, we're showing more than versus today. So once again, it's perception. Perception can be a reality, as we all know. And um, as we're all learning at the same time, it's important for you to know that, that that's in fact what's going on there. If we're simply um, checking the boxes off the tech sheets and looking at what 15 critics said and making sure that all of our descriptors match that, that helps nobody. Um, the whole goal here is that it's an iterative, iterative educational process. 20% uh, send me on by the way. And I don't remember on the grid if we had wax, but I think this wine 
has a little bit of waxy character that would come from the semillon. Yeah, Thanks. you know, just to, and getting back to the comment about oak, I think I'm going to reserve my comments till I get to my first wine, and then I think the answer is going to be very apparent. Okay, fair enough. Awesome. I love awesome. it. Leading Great. the witness. I love. That. So Evan, you're um, next with um, wine and, number two, and then uh, just one other call. Yeah, I'm. Good, which Go allows me to, I was gonna say I'm going number one first. Now just for the people that were out there scratching their heads about Spain, um, a couple of things. Number one, uh, Verdejo, especially when blended with Sauvignon Blanc, which it often is, as we know, in that part of the world, can give you those same sort of uh, lanoliny, uh, waxy, uh, semillon-ish kind of characters there. So if you ended up in Spain because of that, um, you're not, I wouldn't say you were quote unquote completely off base. And by the way, if you've had any of the Verdejos that are being made in California these days too, although they're a little less green and a little bit more citrusy, um, they follow a similar footprint as well too. So don't feel, don't feel bad if you ended up going down that, uh, that path because I think that was probably why it was put into the comments. But anyway, let's move on to wine number two um, in the words of Monty Python and now for something completely different. Um, wine two couldn't be more different than wine number one. Um, it shows uh, physically, if you look at them side by side, as I'm doing right now, um, perhaps not quite as different as, uh, as they were there, but there's certainly a richness to it uh, on the first wine, perhaps a little bit more uh, than, than there was, I should say, on the first wine, but it's bright, it's clear, it's got a medium depth of color, it's sort of a yellow golden-ish sort of thing, a little bit of green, uh, highlights there, which as we know, I just suggest climate, age, or a little bit of both and no, and no bubbling. Um, what's interesting about this wine is as you come through it, it has waves of attack. Um, first of all, and, and I'm going to sort of jump ahead and then come back, is that there is sort of an attack of, of, of oak and of torrefaction and of all the characters that come from there that, that leads me to believe it's going to be in one direction of wine. There's a ton of fruit here, and it is on that sort of riper uh, citrus sort of things. Meyer lemon, for sure. Um, ripe, riper sort of grapefruit pomelo-ish stuff, for sure. Tangerine sort of ripe citrus stuff, for sure. And because of the richness and way, it doesn't necessarily hit all of the, the conditions that you would expect. Of course, it's ripe, but it also gives you that sort of like lemon curd, uh, like Meyer lemon curd or custardy or, or yogurty kind of thing. Um, which is partially maybe a little bit of ML, but also maybe that it's there. A lot, mostly flesh, but again, a little bit of the sweetness of the peel and the zest. Um, that whole range of, uh, of flavors on, on tree fruit and vine fruit. But here, where uh, Madeline's wine was more on the green side, from a nose standpoint, from an olfactory standpoint, here I think we're more in the yellow vein and the riper vein and a little bit more of that Asian pear. Um, definitely some stone fruit, uh, pick your fruit up that you want, but it's sort of fresh and ripe by nature. Touch of tropicality there. And um, I know that that some people always wonder what, what we mean by the coconutty thing. And that's that, like if you're a fan of coconut milk um, and you pick up a little bit of that nuance there, that's usually what we mean there. Not so much the flesh if you spend your time scraping the inside of green coconut, but the actual milk itself. And then um, big floral on this one. I get lots of, of floral notes. Can move on, Li Meng, to the next thing? Mm -hmm. Nothing really green about this wine. Definitely some sort of sweeter uh, other notes that you could pick, whether you want to call it sweet potatoes or, 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 or butternut squash or whatever. Cooked caramelized onions. There's notes of all that. Sweet corn, that first corn that you come to season, if you're out here in California here, that comes from Brentwood. And then a number of spices. But what's interesting, thing is you're tasting the wine too because again we combine taste and, and nose here is that the palate belies the nose there's a sleekness and a leanness and a brightness to the palate that takes all of that exuberance that comes from the nose and sort of pushes it down into the funnel there and, and gives way to a, a slight minerality to it um, definite um, uh, amount of aging but the oak aging that you see here is appropriate for the wine. It's all of those elements that are noted on there, the baking spices and all that, the vanillins, the, the pecan brittle. I want to go to C's candy after that. A little bit of the marzipan niche, touch of oxidation, obviously is contact hand in hand, but just a delightful wine. And structurally, um, it's, it's dry. The acids are bright and sharp in the wine, perhaps a little bit more shocking than what you would have expected by simply looking at it in the nose. Touch of phenolics, um, a lean texture, but a creaminess at the same time, but, but really the acidity, it's the difference what we talk about between the way a wine attacks your palate and the way the wine finishes your palate. And we oftentimes get in, in terms of discussion of what dominates. Does the attack dominate or does the finish dominate? And here to me, although there is a, 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 a roundness 
to the nose and to the top, boom, it finishes really lean and bright and quite long and with lots of complexity. Great. All right, so we're gonna go now to our poll. I'm just gonna flick that open. Um, okay, wine number two. Yeah. Right. Sorry, there's a stop Delay. sharing result. Yeah. Yep. All right, here we go, wine number two. So on grape variety, you have your choices here of Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Garganica. And again, if you have anything and other, please do drop it in the chat box uh, and then regions to go with that as well. This is a wine, by the way, that I'm gonna encourage very much like Tim told you to keep wine one in mind when he speaks about wine three. I want you to keep this wine in mind in general and retaste it in about 20 or 30 minutes. All of these wines, I always say this every time we do a tasting, are sort of like for those of you who have little kids, or I don't even know if they, I don't have little kids anymore, I have big kids. But back in the day when I had little kids, they used to have these things that you could buy in the bath department of the kids store that looked like little um, capsules of Tylenol and you drop them in water and then they um, turned into little sponge dinosaurs and things like that. And to me, these wines are a lot like that in the sense that they come out of these small bottles uh, and then they unravel kind of like on I Dream of Genie or something and boom, over time you'll get this uh, wonderful amount of flavor. And those that are often the most tight when they come out are the ones that are the most giving and rewarding um, in 20 or 30 minutes. I think that wine's gonna be one of those wines. I, I really like Jason Wilson's comment here where he says, don't overthink this one. I think Jason, that's a good comment for all blind tasting. <laughs> don't overthink anyone, um, but that's an interesting comment. Um, Carrie also said, I think Evan, we've talked a lot about this, things change in the glass mm -hmm. that it smells so different now that it's warmed up more. You want to talk a little bit about that while we close? Yeah. Well, for, certainly there are some varieties um, that as they sit in the glass and they come to closer to so-called room temperature or cellar temperature, they're more expressive. Whereas other grape varieties need that hint of crispness and refrigeration, if you will, to pop their flavors. Um, and so that's actually not only a, a, a good observation, Jerry, about the wine itself, but also a clue to maybe the variety that it could be, because not all varieties will do that. Not all varieties become more interesting and more expressive as they warm up. Great. I want to compliment the, the person, is it you, who uh, um, explained why they went to a specific conclusion. That's ter terrific. So you gave everyone um, the, your checklist of, uh, of deductions. So I'm going to share the results. I think this um, has a lot of fodder here for, for you, Evan. We have um, people definitely landing on Chardonnay, much, I think, where uh, Jerry landed up. But there were some votes there for Pinot Grigio and Garganica. So it'll be interesting to see why it isn't those other grapes as well. And then in terms of region, um, Evan, I think it's actually, if you add up the old world Italy and the old world France, you're dead in the middle of a 50-50 here on old world versus new world. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, yeah, the, the, the variety, um, definitely from a lot of people speak Chardonnay in terms of the clues, in terms of the, the grapes texture, the pronunciation of the fruit, the use of the oak with the variety, et cetera. What probably is gonna um, make people move more there as opposed to the other varieties is is first of all, um, Pinot Gris, if, if my experience with the variety, generally, if you put as much oak on it as you have with this wine here, you'd lose a lot of the varietal character and it would be much more a, a study in barrels and oak and, and things like that. Garganaga is a good call, but usually they don't put as much wood as they do on Garganaga, but, but it can in the absolute, um, uh, apogee of what it shows, particularly in the cruise. And by the way, those people out there, if you're not studying your cruise that just got codified in the Veneto up in Suave, you should be looking at that. And another didn't end up too many places. What is interesting here though, Lee Meng, as you pointed out, is the, is the push between uh, old world and, and new world. Um, and this wine has a, uh, an old world uh, sensibility about it. And it is the brightness of acidity and that sort of leaner structure, which doesn't give you as um, for many people who make that, particularly that Chardonnay, California pairing together, 
they're oftentimes blousier. They're oftentimes richer, more voluptuous, more textured, fatter, uh, rounder. And this wine does have a leanness to it, which perhaps speaks to its climate, its interpretation or whatever, but it doesn't surprise me that people didn't end up there. What I'm also surprised about, and if you're not a fan of them yet, you should be, is try more and more of these new um, expressions of Oregonian Chardonnay that are coming out there, because they very much speak the language uh, that this wine does, and which is why it was put down as a choice. Great. Um, so are we ready to reveal the wine? Let's do it. All right. Yeah, here we go. Drum roll, please. This wine this is California Chardonnay. Uh, it is Chardonnay, and I think most people, I believe two thirds of folks ended up there, and bravo to you. Um, I explained the rationale on, the, on, on some of the others. Um, and I think the, uh, the oak and the use of oak um, is definitely something that, that sort of steers kind of new world, although people in the old world use a lot of oak too, just in the, the, the way the fruit pronounces itself. There is a ripeness of fruit level here, particularly on the sweeter citric side and some of that tree fruit that would perhaps be less pronounced in France, um, although it would be truer, I think, to what you're seeing in Oregon these days. And there is a, uh, while there is a minerally sort of stonier character here, it's definitely not as, as pronounced uh, along with sort of that truffly, underbrushy sort of stuff that you would find in Europe, which is why I, I uh, ended up there. But um, it's a good effort. You know, the people at Phelps, I think, have done a great job um, since they started doing this, um, which was back in 06, I believe. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Freestone, Freestone is a namesake town uh, that has an appellation that, for lack of better words, in spitting distance of Bodega Bay, it is included within. Um, and it's really close to the water. It, uh, the wines show these sort of bright, vibrant acidity to them. Uh, the wines um, also farm biodynamically, which might allow its place to jump through a little bit more. Um, and it's all estate owned and estate controlled vineyards. Um, and then year in and year out, I think this is wine, one of the finer efforts off of the Sonoma Coast. And we were delighted that uh, they were game to, to play with Master of the World and uh, having their wine partake with us. Evan, can you comment on this? I feel like I need Rebecca Feynman for this because when we do a lot of tastings, Rebecca always uses this descriptor, corn. Um, Kara here, hi Kara, has asked, can you speak to corn and cooked onion notes? Um, yeah. This mm -hmm. wine, is it from the winemaking? Like, where is this coming from? Yeah, the corn element, and you can take corn in a couple of directions. I think when most people think corn, they think popcorn. And popcorn can be um, more diacetylic, uh, that sort of buttery-ish character that you're gonna get there. Um, but that's a very di different type of element, although I guess the corn thing would encompass it because it starts from the same kernel. Here, I think, and when, when um, Rebecca, who, we, who I, we do have the pleasure of tasting with, regularly talks about it, it is that sort of sweetness of the first corn of the season. So we tend to think of corn, sadly, uh, in many parts of the world as sort of corn niblets that come out of a can and are just sort of starchy and have very little redeeming social value whatsoever. But really good corn off the cob, especially if you pick it yourself and cook it immediately or grill it uh, immediately and actually caramelize some of those corns a little bit will give you some of that character. So oftentimes when people speak corn, they're speaking of the freshness and sweetness of the kernel itself of the corn, or again, a little bit in that popcorn vein. The onion thing is the same thing. If you caramelize onions, they will pick up sort of that same sort of sweet torrified character that we associate with oak, but at the same time add sort of a rounder fatter textural element that if you do um, sweat onions down and then take them to that point where they start to brown and caramelize much as you would say in the onions that you have in uh, like French onion soup or whatever, they also pick up a, a sweetness there, which is magnified by the wine. Awesome. I love Can I make a simple comment, Li Meng? The just to the people, um, you know, who uh, I, I tend to think in simple terms in ter uh, if I'm, when I'm trying to deduce. And I find the nose on this wine to be, um, uh, you know, expressively Californian. And on the palate, I would be hard pressed. I mean, if I wasn't smelling this wine and I was just tasting it, you know, good white Burgundy would be a strong consideration. I don't know if my colleagues agree with me or not, but, uh, you know, no, Tim. <laughs> yeah, we well, are a super taster. You know, <laughs> no, but it's, it, it, I, I, no, I understand, uh, yeah. we, um, Madeline, and I think some of the the, the scoring that we yes. had in the polling suggests right. that there is a there is a, um, and it's probably more structural than it is mm -hmm. the flavor cues and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and uh, and all that. But there is a, that sort of sleekness and youth of young mm -hmm. pooling year. I mean, it doesn't taste like clean, but you know what I'm saying. That same austerity and leanness mm -hmm. to it, and 
but that's a sleekness that, that, that gave it an old world tip of the proverbial. One world. look at the labels worth a lot of money. I need to let yeah. Tim get in so, here. Tim, go for it. Yeah, Evan, question. Do you know the clone on this? Or the clones, uh, plural? I, I am, I'm not aware. I do, do do research on it. I I'm I'm not sure if it's. Uh, I mm. don't suspect that it's purely um, uh, Dijon. I think there's some heirloom in there, but I do not know for that. Uh, it smells like Wente clone. It smells like juicy fruit gum. I mean, that's the first thing. It smells like it smells like pineapple and lime to me. And there's more Wente clone planted in California than anything, so I wouldn't be surprised. Hence, that's I could never go to Burgundy with it, but there's also lack of earth and mineral altogether. Uh, the, the acidity, Maddie's right, is absolutely surprising after you smell the wine because it's just so bracing. And I think that's just location, you know. Um, uh, alcohol is 13.5, and so that matches up, yeah, so. Great, awesome. Well, Tim, since we're on you, my let's, turn? let's go to your, your <laughs> wine number three, the third wine of the day. Okay, hi everybody uh, from behind the Adobe curtain. I want you to know, and I didn't tell Evan, you and Madeline this, but yesterday, right before I watched Jeopardy, and I always drink a Negroni when I watch Jeopardy, but we had the front and back door open because the of weather course. is perfect. But wait, a roadrunner came in the house. So, oh. oh, you're kidding. A roadrunner, you know, it's about two feet long and they're very curious birds and they're fearless because they're predators. But it literally walked in, stood in the living room and looked at me and then looked around and then went out through the back door. So Lost the thing missing was the coyote. Where was the coyote? Okay, on to wine number three. Only in New Mexico, right? All right, so wine number three, Evan said with wine number two, now for something completely different. I'm gonna echo that here because this is definitely different. All right, so starting with the site, definitely star bright, reflects a lot of light in the glass and on the white surface underneath. Uh, the color is definitely a straw to me with a pronounced green that usually signifies youth, but also fruit from probably a very cool climate. Uh, no bubbles in my glass. And then on the nose. And I would just say, goodness, <laughs> this has got a really expressive nose. And it's dominated by flowers, but we're going to get there in a second. There's also a, a great deal of fruit here, both sweet and tart citrus. I like the key lime, Meyer lemon calls, uh, tangerine, and really tart. Yuzu is great, and regular lime, very fresh flesh and peel. Yeah, and there's some green apple, and I think there's also, and that's also fresh and ripe, a little bit of white nectarine, white peach. So everything is on the sweet tart, you know, element. And a little bit of tropical fruit, not too much for me, but the flowers, again, dominate the wine. And so much that even above the glass by an inch, so elderflower, jasmine, freesia, even lilac, citrus blossom, it's really, really pronounced. So everybody, what we've got here is a fully aromatic grape, okay? So we had a semi-aromatic grape, as in Sauvignon Blanc dominant in the first wine, non-aromatic with Chardonnay, now fully aromatic. Okay, no green vegetables, no vegetables at all. However, the wine is definitely herbal, but it's herbal in a very specific green way. Uh, for me, I'm reading this you know, line of descriptions, and to me, what really is strong is verbena and pine. It almost smells like you know, mm. pine resin. Yeah. And also I would say there's some cilantro in here too. There's a very leafy, but very green aromatic quality. Uh, in terms of uh, organic earth, no. In organic earth, I think there's a touch of minerality, but here this is fruit and floral dominant, okay? No animals, no oak aging, no oxidation whatsoever. And perceived winemaking, um, yeah, skin contact because the wine has phenolic bitterness on the finish, that really grainy almond skin bitterness. Okay, all right. Uh, the wine is dry. The acid is medium plus bordering on high. Uh, the alcohol is definitely, for me, a solid medium plus and really no higher. Uh, they have low phenols. I'm gonna take another sip. And everybody, if you're wondering, what is this stuff, phenols? Phenol compounds, right, from the grape skins. And skin contact, semi-aromatic grapes, fully aromatic grapes, especially if you leave the wine in contact with skins for any length of time, you're gonna get that bitterness. So I'm gonna take the taste. And I want you to do this and just swallow it. Yeah, for me, that's almost medium minus in phenols. So it's a fully aromatic grape and, and aromatic grapes have a lot of phenolic bitterness. Okay, the texture is across, you know, the texture here, I'm going round at first, but it finishes tart with phenolics. And the finish is definitely medium plus, 
Complexity, yes, medium plus. Okay, now let's get to the scorecard. Great. <laughs> what do we got? We're going okay. to choose between great varieties here. Definitely, you've got the Gewürztraminer that's an aromatic but, and Torrentes. And then you've got Pinot Blanc and other love, love, love to hear your other out there. Um, part of what I love about what we do, Evan, is that we go through hundreds of wines with our tastings. And then we land on six in a kit. And I cannot believe that it's almost like magic. These three whites are so different. Um, so this is my way of complimenting you and your team on selection. It's really exciting to see it um, this way. Um, okay, so I'm gonna launch the poll. And here we go. Wine number three, please vote. And let us know what you're thinking or what you were thinking. Uh, certainly very helpful, like the last round, to see where all, um, all the folks are to help us with um, the questioning. Um, we have a question here in Q&A from Jerry. Which varietals do you typically call out as a pronounced aromatic wine? Tim. Yeah, well, the basics are, and two of them, are our possibilities here, Gewürztraminer, Torrentes, also various forms of Muscat or Muscat, and then Viognier. And those are those are the primary ones. Great, awesome. Um, I think when we said uh, earlier on in our pre-call that this number three might be a might be a uh, ringer or a giveaway, a guinea wine. I think that that's coming through. People are definitely lending very specifically in a particular region and a particular um, variety. So I'm just I think what's fun with aromatic varieties is once you sort of get your arms around them and, and sort of what they are, hold on to them because then you won't miss them uh, in the future. I mean, they usually speak with a very loud voice. You know, the difference between say, you know, uh, Chardonnay or a more aromatic grape versus that is kind of like your friends, you, you know, if you're back in the days when we could have parties and have people over and stuff like that, you know, the people would park their car and, you know, somebody would come in, put the lampshade on their head and start dancing on your, your table immediately loud, boisterous, et cetera. And some people would be sitting there in their car trying to get up their courage and confidence to walk in the door and actually join you. Aromatic grapes are kind of like the guy dancing with the lampshade on their head as opposed to unaromatic grapes, which need a little so bit of help, maybe from oak, maybe from people, maybe from whatever, to be um, as expressive in office. I have not seen this in my life. I have to look for this experience. <laughs> <laughs> the lampshade. Okay. You will, you will speak when we get to the conclusion uh, about how to determine between the aromatic grape varieties, correct? Because that would be, I'm sure, very useful, particularly here, the Gewürztraminer versus Tarantes. Um, were there any others? What were the others, Li Meng? There's a little blue line there for others. Uh, so, I'm seeing Viognier. So, yeah, Viognier has come out also. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. really interesting mm -hmm. uh, for people to talk about. No one thought that was Pinot Blanc, so maybe we made that choice too easy to eliminate, mm -hmm. Evan. Um, but I guess because of the Torrentes, it was a very logical thing to go into Argentina. So Evan, talk mm -hmm. a little bit maybe about old world versus new world here. Um, given that this is the lampshade wine uh, and it really called itself out, um, where are you, you know, what are your observations from this? Yeah. Well, well I, I think that, that, that first off, and Tim will speak to this more in a minute, you know, this to me is, you know, if you're not super familiar with Torrentes, this is a really good wine to wrap your brain around and hold that thought, as they were to say, because they tend to have this level of exuberance and florality that, we, that, that Tim talked about before, but also because of where, where you know, um, the clone is and where it's grown, it also has in sort of that expression of brightness. Uh, the new world element of fruit tends to be more expressive in the new world. Um, not to say that there's a lot, I mean, you know, if it were Torrentes, uh, Torrentes in South America outside of, of Argentina is rare. There's a bit of what they call it in Chile, it's called Torrentel, and it was an original Criolla grape, and there's a couple of people doing it primarily in the Maule, which is a little bit too warm for me, but whatever. Um, whereas you know, some of those other grapes are planted in, in, in more different places, but that has that sort of ripe exuberance. Um, if you were to take a grape like, say, Viognier that was brought up earlier, and think about the difference between Viognier as it pronounces itself in the New World in California or in, in Virginia uh, and places like that, as opposed to where you find it in the old world where it tends to be um, muted relative, speaks a little bit more to the guy on the lampshade versus the guy still in the car analogy that we talked about earlier. 
Yeah. So, Tim's going back to you. Um, yes. How is it not a Viognier? How is it not uh, old world? All right. So, uh, I'm answering is it you? Uh, his question: Why is it not uh, well old world Viognier from Northern Rhone? It's Condrieu. Condrieu. Condrieu is expensive, right? And and you're going to have very expensive new French oak more often than not on Condrieu. And there's so there's not a great deal of it made uh, above you know, really above average quality across the board. Uh, this wine is so effusively fruity to me and so perfumed and floral, and it has almost a complete oh, yeah. lack of mineral and there's no oak whatsoever. And, and then on top of that, because now I'm going to reach back to wine number one. So this is this is stainless steel completely, right? And who is it, Jennifer, that posted the tasting notes, the winery's tasting notes, the link, and I read it. And they said stainless steel all the way. And I find that very curious because there's a really oxidative quality to wine number one. And the only thing I can say may be a combination of Lees and Simeon, but it still has the texture of used wood for me, even though they say, you know, stainless steel. But we know that, you know, on, on this particular wine, it's 100% uh, stainless steel. Okay. All right. We should, uh, what else do we need to say? Okay. Why is it not Gewürztraminer? Because by and large, Gewürztraminer is just a bigger wine, especially if it's Alsace, higher alcohol, rich, more often than not, acidity sugar. is very different, correct? Can you speak? Yeah, to the, the acid acidity level, just less acid. This has really bright acidity. Okay, uh, all right. The all envelope, right. please, Lee Man. So this is the Enco Tarantes mm -hmm. 2018. Um, really exciting wine. Really liked this wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is a beautiful example of Salta Tarantes. It really is. It's very pure. And, you know, I think once upon a time, Evan, you would probably agree, you know, five years or longer ago, you know, the, the Torrentes was really over the top and, and um, a really good middle road wasn't found yet. And this really nails it in terms of style. Is it the growing region or are they using some specific uh, clones? Because I thought it was one of the prettiest Viognier's yeah. I've ever uh, had. Um, yeah, yeah Torrentes. Well, and Evan, I remember when we <laughs> Sorry, were down there and that's... Yeah, 12 years ago now. <laughs> Seems like another lifetime. And we went to Argentina. Uh, yeah, you we, know, did. We, we did. A, we did a big tasting on uh, Torrentes, and there were four distinct clones at the time, and most of the best wines were from Salta, but that seems so long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. it does. Uh, I, I do think it's worth, point, it's worth pointing out, though, Tim, and it's sort of like um, over time, you know, number one, I mean, the, the grape itself in the north, uh, the, the sort of Salta, La Rioja area tends to be more exuberant than when you're in, say, San Juan or down certainly mm -hmm. in uh, Mendoza, where the clones are actually different, as we you discussed. But I also think that people, you know, that there there was a um, sense of almost over extraction and over expression um, in the past. Yeah. It was sort of like, you know, for some people, just way over the top. And the thing that people didn't like about, say, New World Viognier being sort of soapy and, and all that, they didn't like yeah. about Torrentus. I think more producers these days, and I think the, the team that makes the wines of an angle uh, insulted are emblematic of this, are showing um, restraint, albeit with an exuberant variety. And I think that the quality yeah. of Torrentes that you find out of, uh, out of uh, Argentina these days, particularly out of the North is um, at its... Great. This one is uh, worth uh, memorizing everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, Jason Wilson posed an interesting question. What happened to Torrentes? I felt like it was everywhere in 2010. I think oh, it'd be please. interesting for other people um, in the audience. If you have a, a, an opinion about what happened to Torrentes for you, let us know. Okay. Uh, Tim, wine number four. Now we're going to the reds. Wine number four, the first red wine. Okay. So everybody, um, why don't you go ahead and smell it and taste it? Mm. Ah, that's wonderful. Okay, on the color, the wine is just bright, reflects a little bit of, uh, you know, light to it. The color depth is medium, I would agree, but it's ruby, but it also has some garnet. And, and just from looking at it, the wine is, you know, it's got a little bit of evolution going on. A uh, little bit of staining of the tears, but not too much, you know. All right, so then on the nose, uh, the first thing, again, that, that speaks is, is the wine, is, it's got some age. Uh, so we've got some, you know, some really a range of different styles of fruit and all different kinds of fruit. So to me, it's fruit, and that would be a sour red cherry, cherry tomato, red plum, but they're fresh 
drive and radiate and speaks to the age and, and connecting the dots. And we'll do that all the way through the wine. Uh, there's no blue fruit to speak of. There is some black fruit. There's a little black cherry, black plum. Uh, once again, it is dried, raisinated. And um, also to me, there's orange peel, right? And it's really pops. It's really nice. Um, the stone fruit, no. Floral, yes. And it's dried rose. Once again, everything is dried on this wine and a little bit of dried potpourri. Uh, and then there is some dried leafy greens. Okay, Li Ming, next screen, please. Mm -hmm. All right, so just, you know, everybody is a general, as a general statement about, you know, for me and how I organized all the sensory information, you know, everyone has fruit, right? And you identify the fruit and what you do is that you put it out of the way because what you're concerned about is the condition, the quality of the fruit, which we did a good job on. But here, the main event here are the non-fruit other than fruit type descriptors. Uh, there's definitely mushrooms here and the wine is profoundly earthy and we'll talk about that in a second. To me, star anise, dried star anise, there is dried black olives and again, sun-dried tomatoes, that tomato theme. Uh, in terms of herb, it is, yeah, definitely herbal. Uh, to me, the oregano and the marjoram that are dried really pop. And then red licorice, which you can connect to the anise. And the pimenton, I really like that call. And then as I just said a few moments ago, you know, the wine is pretty, it's profoundly earthy. And that really connects to the age of the wine. So forest floor, mushroom, turn soil, soubois. And then there is, to me, is a chalky, dusty quality. And then, you know, one of the markers of red wine with age, that term venice, venosity, there's definitely some uh, leather and saddle leather, and there's a little bit of the blood and iodine. There's oak aging here, and it would seem like it would be a mix of used and new, predominantly used wine, medium usage, definitely some spices, uh, but more of an oxidative nutty quality. Hazelnut, chestnut are really great calls. And then, uh, you know, chemical compounds, there's a couple of them. And this is uh, almost opening Pandora's box, but there's both volatile acidity on the nose of the wine and there's a little bit of Britannomyces here. And so as your attorney, <laughs> I want you to go out and buy a book that's called Flawless by Jamie Good. Okay, it was published at the end of 2018. It's about wine faults. Jamie Good is a great writer. He's a chemist, scientist by training. And one of the major points of the book he makes is that with the exception of TCA, most of what we call wine faults are absolutely contextual. And this is exhibit A, because I find both the Brett and the VA in this wine to give it complexity and to really add something, especially the Brett on the palate, okay? But it's very oxidative. Uh, wonderfully, it's got a seamless to it. It's very complex, it's layered. In terms of the structure, it is dry. The acid is medium plus, but to me, almost high. And I'm getting, you know, yeah, I can feel it on the enamel of my teeth. Uh, the tannin, you know, uh, is definitely medium plus for me. And here I'm getting pronounced grape tannin in front of the mouth and oak tannin in the back. The texture is astringent at the end, and that's probably a combination of the elevated acid and tannin together. And the finish is long, and the complexity here is high. I mean, this is really good quality wine. Okay, that's my votes. All right. <laughs> And so we're going to now decide between these varieties that you see here and the grape regions. I'm just going to launch this poll here and wine number four. Here we go. So take a moment uh, to launch this poll. Uh, Tim, can you talk a little bit more about sort of this um, blood iodine animal. I'm just going to throw it out there. We do get people asking a lot of questions. How much does that help you get to the finished, the, the end goal? Uh, it's just, you know, it's one of what I call impact compounds. That's just for you, Madeline. So impact compounds um, is a subset of 25 to 30 uh, aromatics and flavors in wine that we as professionals have to own. And Britannomyces is one of them, okay? And Britannomyces combined with earthiness should take you to the old world. And given how strong the varietal markers are, it should take you to a place. It really should. So if you've got Britannomyces and Bordeaux varieties, odds are you're looking at Bordeaux. If you've got Britannomyces and, you know, pepper and game and other type markers, odds are you're dealing with a Rhone grape, okay? Or a Rhone wine, I should say, okay? So, but it's definitely an important marker for you know, identifying a grape or a place. 
And I'd be curious to see if you're in the other camp, what other grape varieties are you seeing in this particular, um, in this particular wine? In me, would I say it's other? No, no, I'm, I'm just asking the folks out okay. there if they have yeah. other, um, no one's yeah. really picked other right now, but I'm, I'm you know, curious to see how everyone's sort of lending up in these three buckets here. So I'm gonna end the mm. poll right now. But Tim, and, one thing about Britannomyces, it can be from the new world as well, correct? I yes. mean, you know, just because- Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, can I just say, Brett, you know, in a lot of really high-end Cabernet and Cabernet blends, if you've got really super ripe, even resonated fruit, and you've got a really high pH, low acid must, that's a that's like a breeding ground for Britannomyces. So there is a lot of high-end red wine from the New World, especially California, that does have some Britannomyces. So Tim, I think that the work here is really in Italy. You know, I think everyone yes. has pretty much ended up in Italy, very few in Spain, no one in New World at all. Um, and between uh, Italy, most people are in Sangiovese, but some are in Nebbiolo. And we do have a question here about how do you tell the difference between um, different types of the Italian red grapes? Um, mm -hmm. And primarily here, uh, it looks like... Uh, I have some question, long answer. Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo Sangiovese, uh, Montepulciano, which is part of that... Um, that whole area. Uh, you know, that's, that's a long question. That's one that, uh, you know, we might write out, you know, I think a, perhaps a more germane question. Well, why don't we reveal the wine and then I'll talk about why I went yep. to X over Y. Okay. Absolutely. Let's reveal the wine. So this is the Roca della Messi from uh, a Chianti Classico Reserva from 2015. So obviously um, most people got this It's in Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just in, in thinking about that question, you know, the, the main choice here was between uh, Nebbiolo, Barolo, Barbaresco, and then uh, Sangiovese and here, Chianti Classico. Right. Uh, to me, this wine is not tannic enough or acidic enough, and the color's not oxidated enough, and <laughs> I'll slow down, the wine's not floral enough for uh, Nebbiolo, okay? Uh, that sour tomato thing is a, is a real Sangiovese thing to me. Uh, in terms of why is Chianti Classico just the size of the wine? And here, I mean, 2015 is a wonderful vintage, so it's got five full years. Uh, the wine minimum 24 months by age, but I think this is, you know, seems to be a little bit older when it was released. Um, I'm looking at the text sheet, it says it's 90% Sangiovese, 5% Cabernet, and then 5% Colorino. Um, I think it's just a wonderful expression of Chianti Classico that has you know, a little bit of age on it, but uh, okay. So now to the other question about why is it not those other varieties? I don't know. Uh, that to me would take- I was just gonna as, say, Tim, if you could, um, just address it for people, because I think a lot of people- Evan, I think we're having problems with your audio. Yeah. I'm ha yeah, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave and come right back, okay? Just get off the internet for some, I'm having internet issues today. So give me a okay. second. Okay. Uh, Tim, so I would, there's a question here about Amarone also. Why not Amarone while you're in the Italian world? <laughs> well, you know, Amarone, if it's Reccio to Amarone, you know, is, first of all, it's made from Pasito grapes, right? So you've got uh, raisinated grapes with uh, elevated sugar content, and you're going to have 14 and a half to 15 or over alcohol. Uh, and you're going to have just a, a much bigger, more intense wine. Um, I think you're going to have an illusion of, aren't you going to have an illusion of sweetness also? Yes. You know, I yeah. think, uh, and that could be a combination yeah. of the, the, uh, the raisinated quality of the fruit, but also the alcohol. I always get yeah. that little illusion of sweetness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's an Amaro bitterness to uh, the wine mm -hmm. as well. So. Um, there's a question here on, I'm not seeing much of an orange tinge that I would expect from Sangiovese. I guess the first question is, do you expect an orange tinge, uh, Tim, in your Sangiovese? Uh, not so much, but it depends on the wine because, you know, if this is Brunello, Brunello by law is going to be older by the time it gets to you. It's going to be five years old. And, and yeah, probably there would be a more oxidative, even orange tinge, but I don't necessarily look that for that in County Classico. The Cabernet yeah. will torque the color also. Even a dollop sure. of Cabernet will um, will uh, um, uh, change the color. You know, make it a little bit darker in the in the yeah. center, which you mentioned as well. But I think this has a little bit of uh, amber rim, don't you? Yeah. Oh, definitely. There's a garnet rim. Evan's back. 
Okay. Evan, I am back. Sorry. Say? I'm having, I'm having a technical difficulty. No worries. Um, um, question for you, Tim. And if you answered it already, just say Evan, while you were out there trying to get your act together, we already answered <laughs> this question. Um, but the difference between um, assessing Chianti Classico versus Chianti Classico Reserva and the differences in terms mm. of concentration, volume, use of oak, etc. Well, yeah, okay, so there's several different things going on. One, of course, aging requirements, right? 24 months, total usually 12 months in wood for County Classico versus just Reserva versus County Classico. And then, you know, probably, let's face it, better vineyard selection, better vintages, uh, more use of wood, certainly, you know, just because you've got better quality fruit. And that is not to say it's great, but just newer wood, higher quality wood. And, uh, you know, from a producer like Rocco della Macia, just, you know, just clearly a, a really good expression of Sangiovese. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is an interesting question. Jennifer here is saying that she, she seems to be doing better identifying the wines with red wines than in white wines. Do you guys find that with your students that, you know, people have biases between reds versus whites or are reds more easy than whites? It's different for everybody. It really is. Personal yeah. experience. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. great. Um, I'm going to move now back to Evan. Evan, um, let's go to wine number five. Yeah, let's hope I stay stable uh, uh, for, for this uh, next few minutes. But wine number five is a, is a, is a different wine um, and a very different expression of fruit and all of that. Uh, the, the color on it um, is, uh, is classic. It's bright. It's clear. It's ruby. It's starting to fade a little bit. Um, and I think that's something that, that uh, when we learn about more what it is later, uh, you'll notice that with this variety over time, it can often do that. Um, but the, the purity of it, the beauty of it is all, is all in the fruit. You know, there's a, a brightness, a succulence, a juiciness. Um, it is an ode to red fruit. And whether you call that red fruit pomegranate or raspberries, sour cherries or slightly uh, or strawberries. Um, it is all about that. And what's interesting about it is there's at one time, and especially if you've tasted it already, um, there's a real sharp brightness to the wine and an expression of acid uh, that will make sense um, a little bit later on. But at the same time, there's a very ripe, almost sort of like slightly hard candied uh, character to that red fruit there. So hold that in mind. Um, you know, there's a kiss of blackberry in there, probably more like a lozenge or something like that, but it really is a celebration of red fruit. A little bit of that sort of sweet citrus uh, thing going on in the mandarins and tangerines, again, expressing the acid and again, a, a fairly strong um, floral element to it. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I apologize for the uh, internet stuff today. You're um, good. You know, Don't worry. A, a touch of uh, maybe, hopefully, it's just on my end. Um, hopefully, uh, you're also getting the sort of nature of the other fruit things there. There's sort of a an earthiness to it, whether you, that, that sort of beet roots and beet roots and a little bit of anise and a kiss of cola, but again, still under this veneer of bright red fruit. Uh, some interesting herbal characteristics here, a little bit of that, uh, that tea leaf. Um, I'm today picking up just more, kiss more mintiness than I remember at last point in time, but again, some spice elements there. A uh, little bit of uh, mineral rock, a little, uh, not so much organic earth. This is really just um, an absolute expression of gorgeous fruit. Um, if the oak is there, it, it's blended. Again, perception of it. Uh, maybe a little bit accentuating that in some of the uh, spicier flavors that you that you find. But once again, it's kept low, regardless of what it is. Um, it's fresh, it's bright, there's no real necessary sense of oxidation or chemical compounds, no, you know, tricks of the trade in terms of winemaking. It's dry, and once again, bright, um, but still uh, ripe at the same time. Alcohol's um, rich on it, texture sort of, uh, again, sort of attacks uh, smooth and creamy and all that, but finishes a little bit on, on the sharp side and finishes long. So we're gonna go on now to the um, fifth poll here. I'm gonna pull this up. Your choices definitely are uh, Syrah versus Grenache. I think this is gonna be an interesting one to juxtapose. And here we go. In the meantime, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, I think we've answered both of these two, so we're good. That's Great. because we're, we're, we're psychic. We understand what the questions are gonna be before they people even know to ask them. Absolutely. <laughs> um, at the same time, you know, if you've already answered the poll, I'd uh, love to see if you are in the other camp or what other things you were thinking of. 
um, when you were tasting this particular wine, that would be really helpful. And it, it feels like people are very split on region. So it'd be interesting to uh, hear why, what took you to the region that you picked? What were the factors that kind of got you there? Mm -hmm. I'll just give everybody another 20 or so seconds and then we'll go with this. Mm -hmm. And Evan, your internet is doing fine right now. Good, on my end, it's going absolutely crazy. I have, I have split screens all over my screen. It's really, uh, it's really insane. So if you can see me and hear me, I'm thrilled. We hear um, you and see you, no good. worries okay. at all. I feel awesome. like I'm Sybil, you know, split personality disorders here on the screen. Awesome, I'm gonna close Thank up. Thank you for call. laughing, Tim, I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you for to everyone who voted. Um, so Evan, clearly a Grenache um, heavy crowd here. And um, like I said, I think that there is New World Cal Cal uh, California coming out, but mm -hmm. every region had um, some pickings. Yeah, so maybe yeah. start there. So let's, let's talk about it. You know, first of all, um, Gamay got low and, and that's, I think, kind of appropriate and Syrah got both lower and people definitely in Grenache. First of all, if you were to look at it, there is a purity to this wine. So when we say Syrah blend or Grenache blend, that doesn't necessarily mean it is a Syrah blend or it is a Grenache blend. That could mean that it is a pure Syrah or it could be a Syrah blend. It's a pure Grenache or it could be a Grenache blend, but not necessarily always a blend. Um, for Gamay, um, the biggest thing for me is it's not, you know, it's a little too weighty for a Gamay to me. It's a little too generous uh, in terms of its texture and richness and um, alcoholic content and all that. And Syrah, there's just not enough of sort of the spice, pepper, the, the potential Smoke. game, all of those other elements that you would associate with Syrah and Shiraz. And if it was more in that Shirazian thing, first of all, it would be exponentially darker in color. Uh, going, go, you know, this is more in that sort of red fruited Gamay Grenache color thing, not in the Syrah thing. Uh, and then if you had the Syrah color, but you had these flavors, it, it wouldn't back up. So that sort of ends you up in the world of Grenache, which is I think where most people ended up. Um, and it, and the purity of, I would say, of a Grenache as opposed to a Grenache blend. I'm not getting enough other accentuating other flavors that would suggest to me that it was anything except pure Grenache. Um, as to country, there's definitely the sort of um, expression of bright new world fruit, which is why I think a lot of people did end up there, particularly in California. But there is an expression of that fruit that sort of feels like it could be from somewhere else, whether that were Ganacha in Spain or Grenache in the southern part of France, there is sort of some of the, the classic markers of the variety that perhaps override its sense of provenance. Great. Um, Evan, do you feel that this wine is boozy? Do I feel that the wine is boozy? Um, I think that the wine is generous. I mean, I, I think that the challenge with um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, spoiler alert, guys, it is Grenache. So when we get there, we'll talk about that. You could actually bring that up at, uh, yep. as we talk about it. Um, to get Grenache to be where it wants to be, to express the fruit in the way it does, you're going to have to pick it at fairly ripe alcohol. Um, Underripe Grenache is not a happy place to be. And while it might make and contribute to some rosé style wines around the world that are exciting, for red wines, um, it, can be, it can be challenging. Um, what's interesting about this wine that comes from the Central Coast, and specifically from my, my dear friend Brian Babcock down there, is that it comes from the Santa Rita Hills. So this is an area that a lot of people would feel is probably too cool, too cold to actually make Grenache uh, correct. But you've got an interesting combination of intangibles down there that you find with obviously Pinot Noir as well too, that for this particular uh, site of vineyard, vineyards work extremely well. So to me, what I get is I get the um, obvious bright expression of Grenache fruit and New World Grenache fruit, but the structural element of it, and particularly the sharpness of the acid that you get there in concert with the creaminess of texture could end, end up sending you to the old world. So I would understand why people would have uh, possibly said that. The only thing that I think you don't get here is you're not getting any really discernible strength of earthy flavors, of underbrush, of garrigue, or of any of the other characters that you would associate with older world Grenache. Mm -hmm. Tim. Yeah, can I just make a comment for those of you that wanted to take this wine to the old world uh, go ahead and pick up uh, the Chianti Classico that we just tasted and just put them side by side and go back and forth. Uh, the Chianti Classico is profoundly earthy and this is somewhere between a Luden's cherry cough drop and strawberry jam. And there's no worth at all for me. Tim, okay. we didn't do this as an option, but I'm curious if you would address 
um, why not Australian Grenache? And I have to say the takeaway mm. from me on this beautiful wine is that if you hold it on your palate, mid palate, there's just just great purity of super ripe, but not overripe red fruit. It's just beautiful. But would one of you mind addressing that? If why, sure. why not Australia, mm -hmm. if it had been given as an option? Yeah, quintessential, uh, you know, Australian Grenache from someplace like McLaren Bell or the Barossa is more often than not, not always, uh, very minty and very, you know, eucalyptus. Mm. So, mm -hmm. and this really doesn't have either, you know, this is like, Evan, can I say, this is like a really elegant frat party. <laughs> Are there any lampshades involved? Grenache, Grenache, <laughs> New World Grenache is like the frat party red wines in that it just wants to get out of control. And this is just has gorgeous fruit, but it's just so superbly balanced. So kudos to uh, Brian on uh, this yeah, beautiful this, wine. This, and this was the first, um, I was chatting with him when we were going over stuff, because he of course suggested 15,000 other quirky wines that he makes that he would love to see in Master of the World at some point in time. But we talked a little bit about this and this wine was the first time he'd ever bottled a pure Grenache from the Santa Rita Hills. So he, he entered it with some trepidation. Uh, it's it's a small production, it's long sold out. So we're, we were fortunate to, to get it. It switched, I believe, into 18, um, although I don't remember if he even made an 18 vintage of this particularly. But um, no, he, it, it's uh, it's an absolute, you know, it's an elegant expression. It lacks, so whoever said sort yeah. of that boozy, generous, um, just tasty, delicious, one thing that you want to kind of grab your 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 drunken friend and give him a bear hug at that same frat party um and and shows what what grenache at the very top end can be um and to me even though it, for uh, to go back to what you were saying about australia those particularly from the veil and particularly from you know the um the high the higher areas and thing like over in blue and stuff like that they tend to have more color more extraction more depth this one mm. is really more mm. about precision to me yeah, um, I, I love this question and, and I've seen it liked also by Brandon and um, asked by Kara. What about comparing this to Washington Grenache? Because we did have people pick Washington. Um, what do you guys think? Washington versus California here. Devin, you want to go first? Mm. With my mouth full of wine. Um, Sorry. It's an interesting, it's an interesting call. Um, and um, I, I could see how that would be a good call. I, I I would say that that um, geez, I'm just trying to think of some. Is some there enough Grenache. Washington Grenache? Made I was, I was the first thing I was going to ask myself is that, that you know well there's all, there's a, there's a certain amount and there's a good amount of Rhone blends. There's a good amount of uh, of Syrah out there. I haven't tasted as many great examples of uh, Washington Grenache to even have frankly a body of tasting work to do that. What I would ask is. Um, uh, Brandon and Talia, who are up in Washington, who taste a hell of a lot of wine, who are on this call, if perhaps they could chime in on the chat and give us a sense of, for them, what are sort of the key markers in um, Washington Grenache, it would be helpful for all of us to- Are you uh, to cold calling the two of them? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, they're, they're, they're much more expert on that. That's their world. That's their backyard. I, I, I will give them some time to think as we go to the last one so that we don't skip out on oh, that last one. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yes. You are on wine number six, Madeline. For the record, no lampshade, no beer keg. We are going to the opera in jeans, but nobody's <laughs> wearing a tie. And I put mascara on, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> and I was an Ann Arbor hippie, but I missed the whole lampshade thing. Okay, that said, um, I'm, I've been playing with uh, number six for a while. Uh, visually different animal here. This is really a neat color. It's worth paying close attention to because the center is a true dark ruby. And then actually it lightens. You have, uh, you don't have so much of a hue variation, but the, the same hue lightens until you get to the very rim where there's a little gradation of color. So this speaks to me to a, a dark skin variety that may have some bottle age on it. Um, you know, it's not it's not strong, but it's there. And that's another reason why looking at the color carefully and simply in direct light is terrific. By the way, the sun finally moved. I was flooded with it. So um, now I'm not blinded by the light, so to speak. On the nose, and the nose is very forthcoming, very generous. And the first word that occurs to me actually is venosity. This wine does have layers and it's forward and it's, it's, uh, it's seen some bottle age, but uh, let's go through it in terms of um, the order of the grid. Um, red fruit dominates to me. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I haven't met a red currant, but I would say red raspberry, red plum, 
um, red cherry, both sour and ripe, maybe a little dried cherry too. In terms of blue and black fruit, they're in there, absolutely. But to me, they don't lead. Um, you know, a little blueberry, a little black cherry, uh, not so much cassis. I don't think of prune in this wine. You know, it's, it, it's not coming across uh, in this particular tasting, just dominantly beautiful red fruit complemented um, with uh, a little bit of uh, blue and black folded in there. Um, go down to floral, absolutely. And it's, you know, rose to me is, is a very strong smell. I, I, I think of this more as um, gentle lavender <laughs> and, uh, mm. and uh, violets. Um, yep. green veggies, uh, mild green peppers, not strong. There's a little bit of that uh, pyrazinic quality, but it's, it doesn't command your attention. Other vegetables, for sure, fennel and anise, there's that nice little licorice -y character to it, and maybe a little cola nut uh, as well. I just love the smell on this wine. It really speaks quality, and as I said, a little bit bottle age. And we can flip to the next screen, Li Meng. Mm -hmm. um, isn't it exciting that after you've been tasting wine forever, you still get excited about it? Mm -hmm. um, regarding yes. herbs, um, absolutely tea leaf, you know, dried leaves here. I think eucalyptus is too strong, but mint for sure, tobacco leaf for sure. You know, this is uh, in the days when we had to do uh, practical exams using cigars. This is what this smells <laughs> like to me. I remember <laughs> and, those days. Yes, an unlit cigar. Um, other spices? are not speaking to me much at this particular uh, tasting, especially not so much pepper, uh, maybe a little bit of licorice. That's the whole fennel anise category to me. Uh, inorganic earth a bit, but to me, it's more about um, organic earth. It's forest floor, up the kazoo, compost, dust, a um, little bit of graphite, maybe on the palate. Animal, for sure leather. And this is an example to me of kiss of Britannomyces that adds to the complexity. And I would argue with anyone who would say that it was too much or verging on flawed. It's not. Um, oak intensity, there's definitely some new oak on this wine, but it's beautifully folded in. And especially with the bottle age, it's integrated. Uh, venosity for sure. You know, I don't know as I'd call it oxidation, but it's showing Venice. It's showing bottle age. Um, we talked about the Brett. Um, I could go on and on about the flavors of this wine, but I will not. I restrain my enthusiasm <laughs> and go to the structure. The acidity is actually, you know, uh, medium plus. It's mouthwatering and it matches the, um, the tannin to me, which is also medium plus and a little bit um, more drying than, uh, than I expected. It's a little surprising to me. Tim, to your, you know, going back to your Sangiovese, that tension between acid and tannin is really great on this mm. wine. The alcohol, yeah. I can feel it. It's not so much a burn, but a warmth, but I would say medium plus. I wouldn't call it high. The texture, if, it, if, you're gonna, if we're going to call it astringent and gritty, I would say gently gritty and astringent. You know, it's, it's certainly not bothersome. It's certainly not harsh. Um, it's, uh, you know, the tannin is expressed, uh, in general astringency that it is long. I wouldn't even call it medium plus, uh, it is definitely long in complexity, medium plus verging on high. I think, uh, there's a remarkable balance to this wine at its mo at this moment in its life. And based on the quality of fruit mid palate and also the color, I think it's got several years ahead of it, but it's showing very well. Great. All right. Our last poll for the day. So I'm going to launch this for you guys to take a look at. Uh, let, definitely let us know per the last five wines where you guys are landing up. I uh, see a lot of early voting um, kind of everywhere, you know. Uh, I think Remember that on November 3rd. <laughs> and today, what you early say? voting. Whatever, early whatever voting. you're voting for, vote. Just um, vote. Uh, I will tell vote. you, as someone who spent several years in Greece uh, when it was under a military government, that vote is precious. However you want to spend it, spend it. <laughs> here, here, for sure. Uh, so I'll just give it another 20 seconds or so. Uh, and talk.
thinking about these options. Should I do that or wait till everyone well, wait for a little bit? I just want to address since uh, Brendan and Talia was so generous in jumping in with what Washington Grenache is like. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much for doing that. Uh, so you can see on on the uh, chat there and Jennifer again, great job voting today. For those of you who haven't voted yet, please be prepared to do so. And um, yeah, definitely make your voice be known out there. All right, I'm going to end the poll and we're gonna share this result here. Um, in our vote, Cabernet is king. So we've got uh, definitely a 69% of folks actually going the Cabernet route, but we do have a, a, a bunch of people going the Malbec and some going the Tarigan route. No one went other. So I think Madeline, you do have your work cut out a little bit here, trying to explain between Cabernet and why not Malbec versus yeah, and, and I'm actually going to try to um, uh, to walk a diplomatic razor's edge here, but you know, everyone don't forget that Cabernet slash blend can have significant amounts of Merlot in it. So hold that thought. Um, Malbec slash blend, to me Malbec, you know, certainly the color might speak to Malbec, but this didn't for me have a, a pronounced enough um, florality to it. You know, that's my personal uh, thumbprint for Malbec and also maybe perhaps even softer tannins. I've been lucky enough to taste a chunk of Tariga Nacional thanks to, um, to Evan. And I'm, you know, I, 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 I want to go to the Douro and camp there for a week. But uh, <laughs> I think, you know, again, you have uh, primal black fruit leading with Tariga um, and, and a florality as well that Malbec can have. Um, I, in terms of the regions where... Yes, so people are lending oh. up in France in Old World. Mm -hmm. um, there is some New World here. If you add up both Argentina and Chile, um, that actually adds up to over 30% uh, versus... So, a, so a, big, a big question is why Old World on this one? Yeah. And I, I would say to me, you know, again, one can be surprised. One look at the labels worth a thousand bucks. But what speaks to me Old World from the moment I put my nose in the glass is that um, uh, just wave of forest floor compo compost, uh, some graphite, but you know, this to me is the definition aromatically of um, organic earthiness. You know, those the gardeners will recognize this. Um, now, uh, uh, it's interesting to me that a lot of people are going Cabernet Sauvignon dash blend because remember all the red fruit I got. And that's why I, I threw that in there as an option. A blend can have uh, significant amounts of other grape varieties in there. And Cabernet tends to be the elephant in the room, right? Even a dollop of it, like the 10% that the Chianti had will, will, will uh, torque it in one way or another. So we're gonna reveal, yes? Yes, absolutely. Da -da 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 -da. absolutely. So this is indeed Bordeaux, bravissimo. It is Senna Steph, but I will tell you, and I should have corrected this earlier, this is dominantly Merlot. Um, so no, never mind. Um, it's a Bordeaux blend, but why, why dominantly Merlot, at least in this tasting to me, first of all, Senna Steph, especially on the, the smaller wines, um, uh, can have a lot of Merlot in it, you know, past 50%. And the red fruit pulls this wine, the red fruit leads this wine with blue and black, you know, following. Um, this is not a right or wrong thing. It's just an is thing. And, you know, would I put this in the right bank? No, I wouldn't. And I'll tell you why, because of the tannin structure on this wine. Um, and, uh, you know, again, right bank wines can have significant tannins, but there was a, a little bit of a, that gritty astringency to it that spoke um, left bank to me. The vintage is very interesting. Because, you know, there are some, uh, like 15 and 16 were glorious, you know, mm -hmm. um, wonderful vintages. And 14 is a good vintage. Uh, 13, I think, got sent to the moon. Uh, 12 is a good vintage. Um, 9 and 10 are other terrific vintages. But 14, uh, to me, speaks of a good vintage that even with a few years bottle age will show venosity. I'm curious if my colleagues agree with me. I think this is a beautiful example of what it says it is. And I am really enjoying this wine. Tim and Evan? And you go first, then I'll jump in. 
Yeah, I Maddie, mean, I can only echo what you're saying. You know, this is the kind of the style of Bordeaux. Uh, when I was studying way back when, when there were pterodactyls and overhead <laughs> projectors and things like that, this is a style of Bordeaux that we tasted, you know, we practiced with. And I think it's just, you know, glorious wine. And it's understated and it is so complex. And I would hazard a guess that it's a really good value too. This is, by the way, from the prop, it is from... Uh... Um, at the, made at the hands and from properties owned by um, the folks who own Felon Segur, which is now okay. classified, but very notable um, estate yep. in uh, Senestef. And by the way, um, there is no specific tech sheet unless I didn't look closely enough. It says mostly Merlot, period. And it's been <laughs> aged for 12 months, period. So, you know, uh, this is kind of cool because we're made to pay attention and the wine is telling us uh, mm -hmm. about itself as opposed to, you know, a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah and our, yep. our apology certainly on the back end, we will make that correction. So it will automatically update life uh, in your grid as well. Oh, no, my badly, Meng. I should have caught it and told uh, you I apologize. Not at all, not at all. Um, I, I have a couple of questions here that I wanna make sure I answer. Um, there is a question here and um, about what's the price point on this particular Bordeaux. Um, I think Andrea, if you can pull that and answer that, that would be awesome. Uh, I know that we have some suggested retails here. And then there is a question here on Jerry, from Jerry asking for um, specific sessions um, with, with Tim specifically here. And I would say that we also have um, uh, and a tool that we will be launching very shortly. Um, and yes, certainly we are going to make uh, folks available here, limited time slots because everyone's really busy um, to definitely do individual coaching sessions. Because I think it's to your um, preference and your experience how to, how to taste. But hopefully this has been really helpful. Um, I think without further ado so that we can end on time, I'm going to uh, just bring up some, um, some ending, ending notes here in housekeeping. So please help us grow. Please help us share the love at Master the World Wines, uh, hashtag Master the World. We're certainly trying to up our game on social media here. And so you should be able to follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you haven't already. And certainly please tag your tasting. We'd love to see your setting and how you're tasting as well. Um, we have a very exciting partnership. This is super cool. Um, we have six wineries from the top 100 featured in a partnership with Wine and Spirits. In the recap for this particular uh, recording and uh, shortly this week on our um, on our website, this this kit will be available for purchase. And um, Wine and Spirits is doing an amazing uh, five day series of seminars. And these wineries and the wines that we're featuring in the kits will actually match up with at least wines from three of the seminars. So if you're attending that, I think they have a very affordable price point for those seminars. Um, you can also uh, buy these kits to go with it rather than trying to buy 750s uh, to go with that. Um, and then we hope that you can join us for the next webinar. It's literally Thanksgiving week. So we're thinking we're either going to be like, four of us drinking here by ourselves with our team um, or, you know, 90, I mean, right. <laughs> right. we'll turn everybody's videos on, um, you know, so we hope that you can join us and we can uh, maybe have some fun Turkey talk. And this next seminar actually, it's really uh, a great one. Evan, you want to just talk a little bit about what this next seminar is? Yeah, no, I mean, one of the, you know, we listen to all of the feedback that we get from you and from all of our other subscribers um, from various parts of, of the States. And one of the um, teaching moments that, that I've heard often enough from enough people that we're going to trial this one out, see how you all like it, is to sort of take a single grape variety and look across different uh, geographies around the world. So rather than doing different grapes and different geographies all in the same kit so that you know, every uh, every week has been essentially, uh, you know, a, a, a trip around the world uh, in six classes. This is going to be a trip around the world, but it's going to be done through the prism of uh, a single variety or variety blend. So uh, I hope it I hope it um, is is very teachable. I mean, it's a very teachable thing for everybody. But as we were trying to really get mastery on a particular grape variety, this will be a terrific way to do it. And um, you'll let us know what your thoughts are as to whether we should do it again, do it more often, or um, that was a really cool idea, Evan, but I think you're gonna like it a lot. And the only other thing I would add, and maybe Lee Meng, if we, if we pop the uh, follow-up email out there too, is I know probably a lot of you have and are aware 
of it, but we are hosting um, Full Circles Beverage Conference starting next week. And this is gonna run two sessions a week, 90 minutes a session using Master the World kits uh, for, for several of the sessions, which I believe sadly are sold out, but nevertheless, sessions are gonna rock and roll anyway. And uh, registration is free, just like this, you can come on and there's gonna be sessions from different parts of the world, different wine topics and all that. And um, even if you can't be there like this session, um, they will be archived for all folks who register to, to watch them a little bit later on. You'll see my two partners in crime here, Tim and Madeline appearing in certain sessions, other of our uh, friends of, of Full Circle and friends of the Master of the World that will be doing it. And again, for those people that have already signed up, you're probably gonna get some kits too, but nevertheless, um, another fun way to spend some time and learn a lot over the next month. I, I just, I'm amazed at how Andrea like just reads my mind. Uh, thank you, Andrea. She's already um, got the link to our beverage conference uh, in the chat box. So if you're not signed up for it, definitely sign up for it. And as Evan said, um, I think that pretty much we are sold out on all the kits, um, but you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, just coming on, you'll see a lot more winemakers and all that. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Eight plus. And for the, and I would just add for the Uber geeks out there, and I know some of you are sitting in our audience tonight, um, we always add stuff for them. There's going to be an entire seminar on the role of oxygen and bottle aging. And we're going to talk about the difference between OIR and OTR. Uh, and for those people that really are into that sort of stuff, you won't want to miss that one. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys again. Thanks so much for being here. It was a pleasure to enjoy these wines with you guys. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, Tim. Um, and, you know, until the next session and, um, can't believe it till Thanksgiving almost. All right, we'll talk soon. Take care. All the best to everyone. Be well, yeah, everybody. Remember to vote. Yep. <laughs> very, bye -bye. very important. Thank you. All right, talk to you guys soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.